Microservices DevOps with Donovan Brown. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and to run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company that empowers .NET development teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results. Uh, They are hiring architects as well as .NET engineers who'd like a path to become an architect. So you can go to clearmeasure.com slash careers for that. And if you have a question or comment for the show, just send me an email at podcast at palermo.network. And also my new online TV show has launched. So you can search for, quote, Programming with Palermo in any of the podcast directories. And of course, you can also find it on www.palermo.network. Well, let's get into the show. I have a returning guest all the way back from multiple years ago, episode number two, Donovan (laughs) Brown. He's a partner program manager in the Azure CTO incubations team at Microsoft. The incubations team focuses on forward-looking development and innovations to facilitate the development of new projects and ideas. Before joining Microsoft, Donovan spent seven years as a process consultant and a certified scrum master, and he's traveled the globe helping companies develop solutions using agile practices in many industries. Donovan is an avid programmer, often finding ways to integrate software into his other hobbies and activities. Donovan, welcome back to the show. How are you, sir? I'm I'm pretty good. I just can't believe it's been that long. It's it's unbelievable how much has changed. Time flies when you're having fun. It does, indeed. (laughs) Well, there are a lot of people who heard you speak. And of course, at the time of the recording last week's uh, Ignite conference, you gave you gave some sessions there. But the audience has always grown. For the people that haven't, give us some quick high points. What are the high points in your career that kind of led you into doing the type of work that you're doing now? Uh, it's interesting. I guess it first started just falling in love with writing software. You kind of don't know that this is what you want to do. I didn't even know I could do this for a living. Right. I was just Mm -hmm. writing software because I thought it was cool to make a computer do whatever I wanted it to do. And then all of a sudden someone asked me to do it professionally. And I'm like, what are you you're gonna pay me to do this thing that I would happily do for free? Like, yeah. And there's a degree for it because I was a biology major when I realized that I switched over to computer science, went and got a job at Compact Computers, started programming from them. And then like here I am talking to you right now. Right. So that pivotal moment was just finding out that that thing that I love to do for fun, I can actually do for a living. And then uh, I did that for a long time. Obviously, this was around 96. So I was right there for the dot-com bubble. So I jumped around like crazy around like, mm. between like 99 and 2001. I was as many places as I could go because we all were just chasing. I was chasing dollar signs at the time. Mm-hmm. But it gave me a lot of unique experiences with software, software development, different languages, different software development life cycles, the pains, the, the struggles, the tribulations of all that kind of stuff. And what I realized is I gained this huge body of information and knowledge on things to do and things to avoid, which made me a really good candidate for process consulting, which is what I did right before I joined Microsoft. So I'd go around the world helping companies not make the same mistakes that I'd made the 10 years before I met them. And I got certified as a scrum master, who, which I'm actually flexing those muscles now on my current team. I'm, I'm helping mm-hmm. train uh, some scrum masters there, which is a lot of fun. And then I finally got into Microsoft as a seller, actually. So I was selling Visual Studio, TFS at the time, being a long time developer, it was easy for me to go in and show just how amazing these tools are because I've been using Visual Studio since it was Visual C++ 1.52. Like, so I've grown up like in this environment. In so I can show you all the cool stuff about it. And that's what I did for a while. Did a demo on release management, 2014, I believe it was. It was the last tech ed North America. And when I did that presentation, the marketing team was like, wow, this, this guy's okay at this. Like he can, he can really get on stage and have some fun. So they sent me over to Europe last tech ed Europe. So I got to do a lot of the last oh, yeah, of events, sure. right? And I did a session there. And then that's when the dev team that actually was making VSO at the time, we called it VSO at that time, was like, okay, Donovan, we need you to come over here and make the product as good as it looks on stage. Because mm-hmm. you're doing things like it doesn't, it's not quite as good as you make it look. So come over here and tell us how to make it as good as you make it look on stage. I'm like, sure. So I became a PM, kept speaking a lot. 2015, I got my first keynote at Ignite, I mean, at uh, Connect 
in New York with, with Scott Guthrie. Scott liked what he saw and brought me with him to build and ignite and like every other major event. And that's where I started to build a name for myself as a DevOps guy. I uh, coined the term Rub DevOps on it in 2016. That still sticks with me to this very day. Mm-hmm. So it's just been a lot of those, those moments of just being able to crystallize a thought on stage at a pivotal moment and, and where Microsoft needed that message landed. And luckily I was the one tapped on the shoulder to land it. And it continues today, which is why you saw the session I just did at Dapper. It was like, okay, we need someone to come out here and just show how microservices can be a lot easier to write because we're mm-hmm. all being asked to write them, but they're not getting any easier to write. Like they're just, there's the options, the sheer op- number of options you have when you want to do pub sub or service to service and vacation or state management or secret management are so vast. It's dizzying. Yeah. Right. Like you say, like, which one do I choose? And the answer might be different depending on where you're running. And now my code becomes more complicated. My dependencies become more complicated. Keeping them up to date becomes annoying, right? Because Dependabot is sending me pull requests every single day because I have so many packages. And that's why I was so excited to share with people about Dapper, because a lot of that noise just goes away. Right. You're able to focus on the value you want to deliver to your customer. And, and that's always been important to me. Even when I define DevOps for Microsoft, the most important word in there is value. Mm -hmm. It's not about shipping software. It's about shipping value. And when I saw Dapper and what the team was doing, and I was lucky enough to get to join the team that produced Dapper, I've just attached myself to it as, yep, I see this as a way to deliver value. So anything that Microsoft does that I see as a key enabler of delivering value, uh, I'm all about screaming it from the rooftops for our customers to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just to the listeners, if you've never heard Donovan speak at a conference in person or just go online, there's plenty of videos. Yeah, yeah. I encourage you to do that. Great teacher and and Thank you. Uh, simplifies things. Now, you mentioned microservices. What are the differences in a DevOps environment for a microservices from a interior application? Or, or are there? Uh, it depends on how well it's architected. Right, because if you're a purist when it comes to microservices and every microservices microservice can actually ship independently of everything else, then life becomes very simple, right? Because I ship when I want to, I have an automated pipeline, I'm not going to break anyone, I'm using the proper versioning of my APIs so that even older clients can use me and not break, and the newer clients can start taking advantage. If you've done everything right, if you've architected everything correctly, and I've not found many people who have, then life is great. You just have a very simple pipeline that ships just your microservice whenever you feel that it's necessary. You do all the same best practices as ever, right? You'll do infrastructure as code. You'll do static code analysis. You'll do scanning of your images, scanning of your packages. Uh, you'll do unit tests, integration tests. Like you'll do the whole nine yards, security scans, but it's just for you. And that's what's beautiful about microservices when done right is that they're micro. They're small. They're simple. They're easy to digest. There's not this big giant monolith that you have to move all these pieces in unison and even deploying bits that didn't change, right? Just Mm -hmm. because you don't don't know how it fits together. Now, what a lot of people will find themselves in is where they're teasing apart a monolith, right? Where they have this big giant monolith, but they're really trying to tease it apart. And of course, those pipelines get more complicated until you reach that, that nirvana of, okay, we're finally now completely broken apart. And sometimes you stop short of that because there's just no more value in teasing apart Mm -hmm. that one or two last services or they're so tightly coupled that you'd never... That's um, good enough. Yeah, yeah. Or you never would like rev one without the other or you would never want to scale one without the other because that's one of the things that kind of drove us for on the Azure DevOps side. There's times where we need to rev pipelines and add new features, but we don't need to do anything with work item tracking or with mm-hmm. source control. There's times where we need more scale for pipelines because it's extremely popular, but we don't need that same scale for version control, I mean, version control, package management. But if you have them all lumped together to get more build, you have to get more of everything else. And right, that becomes right. extremely expensive because the machines you need to scale up or even scale out a big giant monolith is really expensive. And what's so sad is that you're only doing it for a fraction of the workload. So by being able to identify the workloads that you need to scale first and actually pulling those out as microservices, you can now rev and scale those without having to scale the big giant monolith. But again, Mm -hmm. those pipelines become a little tricky because there's usually some interdependencies. The infrastructure might be shared for a little bit longer than we want it to be. So to answer your questions, there can be pure, crisp, perfect pipelines for just microservices but there's a whole bunch of gray there <laughs> as you start to tease apart a microservice. I mean, tries to tease apart a monolith into microservices. Mm-hmm. We're going to be living in this type of hybrid world. 
But even in that world, pipelines make your life easier, right? I, yeah. I, I, I'm just a, I, it's one of the first things I build. When I want to go create a new project, the first thing I think about is, okay, where am I going to run this? Like, what infrastructure am I going to need? And then I lay down my infrastructure's code first. So I go and I write the bicep files. You can do the same thing with a microservice. I'm going to be in Kubernetes, or I'm going to be in uh, Azure Container Instances, or I'm going to be running inside of App Service, or I'm going to be running inside of Container Apps. Whatever you decide your infrastructure is going to be, I would sit down and write that bicep file. And then I would create a pipeline, either be it in Azure DevOps or in GitHub Actions or Jenkins or whatever CI CD tool choice you have. And then I would start deploying that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'd make sure that that pipeline worked, right? Great. I can get my infrastructure into dev. I can approve it, get that same infrastructure into QA. I can approve it, get it into production. Beautiful. I can tear down dev and QA and save myself some money. And then as soon as I do another PR, dev and QA stand back up. Like that's step number one for me. Get my infrastructure laid out, get it deploying. And then I just start writing my program. And I just start laying in on top of it and adding those features and life becomes a lot easier. And I've kind of flipped the development on its ear because most people leave the pipeline to the end. They leave deployment to the end. Mm -hmm. And what I realize is that it makes things a lot more painful that way. It's much easier to lay the highway from time zero to the, to the finish line first and then just ride that highway over and over again, just running laps on it sure. as you add new features to your program. You mentioned microservices and I've heard plenty of teams at Microsoft have started to adopt mm -hmm. it. And, and of course, tons of customers. And just the nature of showing a sample, there's a sample of one or two code files. How big, in realistic form, how big is a microservice? Can you give us an idea? Because <laughs> it's obviously not a single web API controller and that's it, or a single Azure service bus handler and that's it. But in practice, at the customers you've seen at Microsoft, are there some number, you know, average number of lines of code or average number of handlers or controllers that tend to be there? I know, Without the it depends, I know in, I know intuitively nobody believes they're not going to make a microservice of just one API controller. Surely you're not going to do that, right? It all depends on what it is. Sorry, I, just, I mean, just maybe, maybe, I didn't mean Twitter maybe, maybe Twitter will. Maybe maybe Twitter will, but just the yeah. normal application developer. Yeah, I couldn't even start the answer without saying it depends. I was trying not to say it depends, but there, what's the saying? A microservice is small as it can be, but no smaller, right? Like that's kind of like it's a, it's a funny way of saying it. But what I look at is what is the problem I'm trying to solve? I'm trying to solve authentication. Great. I need a username. I need a password. I probably need to find my password. Like, what are all the things I need for authentication, right? Not authorization. That could be a completely separate microservice. First, I just need to buy, authenticate who you are. And part of authenticating you, again, is allowing you to log in, allowing you to reset your password, potentially allowing you to register. Now, that could actually be a separate microservice. So in my mind, I'm thinking about these things. Like, is registering for my app something that's going to happen a lot. Authentication is going to happen every day. It's going to happen a lot, like mm -hmm. multiple times a day per customer. I'm only going to register once. So do I want to have to scale registration every time I scale? Uh, it, it's Black Friday and everyone's logging in trying to get that sale, but no one's registering. They all registered a week ago. They've mm -hmm. had accounts for years. So when I'm thinking about a microservice, I don't ever think about, okay, I can only get to so many lines of code. I can only have so many mods. It's never that way. It's like mm -hmm. there is a domain, there is a specific problem that I am trying to solve and it's something that can be versioned, shipped, and, and scaled independently of everything else. And I don't want to bring along any more weight, I guess, or, or debt, or I don't know what's the right word. I don't want to bring along any more code than I need to to solve the problem that I'm trying to solve. So authentication is a really good example of I want to be able to authenticate. I need to be able to authenticate quickly. Checkout's another one, right? Now that you're authenticated and you're on myshoppingsite.com and you're trying to get mm -hmm. that Xbox One, you're going to want to be able to check out really, really quickly. And I'm going to need to scale up and make sure that that part of the app works. So authentication is one part. Authorization might be a separate part. Registering is definitely a separate part that I probably is going to be running on the smallest instances that we have used very infrequently. But then checkout, holy macro, like checkout has to be fast. And mm -hmm. I need to be able to scale it up at a moment's notice. So again, what I'm thinking about is which of these do I need to scale independently of everything else? And how can I then write it in such a way that it works? And then also think about the one database per service, right? Like you shouldn't have microservices sharing data stores. If you do, you're kind of mm -hmm. breaking the rules. It's supposed to be one Autonomous. domain, one thing, like one database, and only I'm in there, mm -hmm. right? So when you start to think about it like that, it becomes less of a question of how big is it or am I, is my microservice getting too big because it has a lot of APIs on it? Like if all those APIs are required, to solve that one sliver of your solution, that one sliver of your domain, if everything in here needs to scale together, rev together, 
mm -hmm. shipped together, that to me still helped define that microservice. Say that, say that again, because I, I I do encounter a lot of people that say, oh yeah, we're 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 on the microservices path and we're in the middle of our microservices refactoring. Oh, but our SQL Server database is still as it was, you know, 20 years ago. All they sure. did was split up the compute parts. So sure. Re yeah, yeah. So reinforce your view right on now, the database. Yeah. So when I hear a scenario like that, that is clearly someone who is tearing down a monolith, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they saw a monolith, which usually, trust me, come on, go back 10, 15 years. What did we do? We started with the database and then we just layered yep. crap on top and of it. And it just grew right? and so grew and grew. Exactly. The database was the law. Like mm -hmm. that's where everything lived. Even a lot of business logic and crazy stored procedures that were way too big and had no business being that day. Like we remember those days. So that's where we started. But what we're realizing is, is that we need to be able to separate that stuff out. So again, a lot of people will start with the client facing parts of the microservice migration because that's the easiest part. Mm -hmm. Taking out that, that surface area that I'm using, those API calls, those, H, those REST calls that I make and putting them over here so I can scale them up is great. But what you're going to realize very quickly is as you start to scale that up large enough, your database becomes the bottleneck, right? Because your database isn't just serving you as that one microservice. It's serving the mm -hmm. entire monolith. It's serving right. everything. So now all of a sudden you're having resource limitations. You're having locks. You're having issues with contentions between different people trying to run store procedures that theoretically don't have to know a lot about each other, but for whatever reason, reference a column in a table that you're trying to access right. and now everybody's locked up, right? So I think what happens is as they're on that migration and everyone goes through what you're describing, right? I don't know anyone who says we're going to tear apart a monolith and start it with the database. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to meet that customer and, and learn from like what motivated you to do that and how well did that go? Most people start with the APIs. That's Most right, because then, the then they have to refactor the code that they're scared of in the first place. Exactly, exactly. And a lot <laughs> of reasons that that takes so long is because unit testing is still like a black art. <laughs> uh, I'm, I am dumbfounded and terrified by the number of companies that I meet that don't write unit testing. Like if you were to go back and ask anyone, is unit testing a part of your definition of done? Again, using a, a concept from Scrum, mm -hmm. the answer is no more often than it should be. Yeah. Like, there should oh and the question oh we just never have time for it I'm like they asked you for an estimate you're the one who decided to estimate it without unit testing it right right i asked you how long it was going to take and you told me four days and maybe i said oh that's a long time so then you told me three days and the first thing you cut was the unit test that's on you yeah right you should have said no it's four days right because quality is not something that we're willing to to jeopardize it's not something we're willing to compromise on you can move the date or you can reduce the features, but we're writing those unit tests, right? And, mm -hmm. and I wish more people did that. And then the reason I'm saying this is to go back to the part where you said, now they're going to have to touch the code they're scared to touch. The mm -hmm. reason they're scared to touch it is because there's no test that tells right. them if they've made a mistake or not. Yep. Right? So this is a crucial piece of code with zero unit tests on it. And if I make a mistake, I could bring down everything. So I'm going to touch that part last, if ever, mm -hmm. which then throws off everything. So I am a huge, huge, huge fan of writing unit tests. I write them... Generally, before I, I try to do some test-driven development, but I'm not a purist when it comes to test-driven development. I always tell, tell people I'm a test-aware developer. What I mean by that is that I have this nagging voice in the back of my head saying, you're going to have to write a test for that. Is that method easy to write a test for? Mm -hmm. And generally, it's not, right? You have all this nested if statements that are going to be really hard to get in the nooks and crannies of all that code. But if you're thinking about, oh, man, that's going to be hard to test. It's amazing how quickly your brain starts to rewire and rewrite that method so mm -hmm. that you can have shortcuts. You can quickly right. validate and get out of there and not have to go through all these nooks and crannies of your code. So I call myself test aware because I'm thinking about the tests I want to write, even if I know I'm not going to write them first. I still call that test driven because in a pull request, you can't tell if the test code came before the production code, <laughs> but you still <laughs> sent the pull request with the tests. That, that's true. I, I, I agree. But part of me is like, ah. The code I write when I truly do test-driven development mm -hmm. looks nothing like the code I wrote when I wrote the test later. Like yeah. never, because it's so it's so much pure and so much cleaner and so much mm -hmm. shorter, right? When you do proper test-driven development and you write the test that define the acceptance criteria of that method and you only write enough code to pass those tests, the code is drastically different. And what a yep. lot of people fail to realize is that test-driven development is not a testing methodology. It's a design. Design. Like, it, like you're designing software this way and the code does look different. So uh, if I had enough time to refactor, they, they should look very, very similar. But I also know when I have a passing test, I'm not quickly to go rewrite my code to write another test that might, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so it does look slightly different. You might not be able to tell, but I think if you see purely written TDD, 
that code is just cleaner and, and more efficient than code that had the test written after, in my opinion, in the way that, in the way that I write code. Yeah. Now, I still agree that regardless of when you write the test, write the freaking test because mm-hmm. I know code and I'm more intimate with every line of code that I've written that I've written the test for because I know all the nooks and crannies. And all of a sudden you have these like, wow, I expected that test to go somewhere else. I can't believe it didn't go to that line of code. Like, oh my God, that's, right. I didn't expect that reaction. So I have to go rename that test. because That test did test some really cool functionality, but not the test that I thought I was trying to test. And I have to go write another test that gets into the part of the code that I wanted to. I'm like, wow, I really understand this better than I did before. And that's a practice that I apply before I change anyone else's code. Mm-hmm. If the tests don't already exist, I will write tests before I touch a line of it that just prove that it does what they claimed it does. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you think this code does before I touch it? Because I want to make sure it continues to do that after I touch it. And it also does that thing that I need it to do in addition to what it's supposed to do now. And in Visual Studio, there was this, was it IntelliTest, I think it was? It was a feature where you can point it at an existing function and go test this to 100% code coverage and just give me a test suite that verifies that it, like, all of them pass and do what it's supposed to do. And then I go add my test and I make sure that all the original tests pass and the test that I wrote still passes as well. That means I've added the functionality correctly. So yeah, I could talk your ear off about testing and the importance. And I used to be the person who didn't write unit tests. So I've come the whole, the whole path of that, right? I've come from the guy who didn't write them because I thought it'd be faster. Mm-hmm. And then realizing that you lose far more time fixing a bug that escaped to production than you would have in writing the unit test up front. Yeah. And I've been that guy who's like wrote a lot of unit tests and none of them failed. And I thought I was wasting my time. Then all of a sudden I make a change and a test fails. I'm like, oh my God, thank God I Saved wrote all your the tests. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because that would have escaped into production. And repairing my reputation for a crash is far, it takes far longer than it mm-hmm. takes to write those unit tests. So yeah, I've been the whole gamut, but I am a I am a huge fan and I refuse to tell have anyone convince me that it's better not to write them. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Clear Measure is also happy to be a sponsor of the video podcast, Programming with Palermo. Watch, learn, and program alongside Chief Architect Jeffrey Palermo. Videos are added weekly and available on syndicated locations supporting video podcast or by visiting palermo.network. Tune in today. Yeah. All right. So you described a, a DevOps environment for a microservice and some of those characteristics and key point that I pulled out from what you said is that it, it has all the same elements as any other type of application of any mm. architecture. It's got to have the same, a, a complete mm. DevOps environment. So whether it's from scratch or whether it's refactoring, now I've got, what, half a dozen little smaller applications. And each of them have test suites, multiple environments leading up to production. What does it look like? There's got to be some new concepts to correlate those, you know, you know six, 12 pipelines with six, 12 different smaller applications to deploy because you're, it, it, we have a, don't have to have a version of here's what version the whole system is at, or how do you think of the whole system when now you have multiple little applications running around? What's really important to make sure that you survive the scenario that you just described is making sure that you have the proper versioning scheme on your microservices, because then they're just like, how are they any different than any third party API that you use at that point? Mm-hmm. Right. Stop thinking of them as, oh, they're special because we wrote them. I used to tell my teams this all the time. Every library that we use, put it in NuGet or put it in some, like treat it like any other third party. Just because we wrote it doesn't change the way that we consume it. It doesn't change the way that it's version. It doesn't change the way that we scan it. It doesn't change the way that we rev it. It's just another third party library or web service that we use. Treat your web services the exact same way. And you're describing the scenario where now I have all these different pipelines. Show me a company that only has one pipeline. Mm-hmm. None. Like show me a company today who's not even doing microservices. They have more than one pipeline because they have more than one application. And if you do the microservices correctly, that's what it is. It's its own application that you just happen to be taking a dependency on, just like you would the Twitter API or the GoDaddy API or some other API that, that's external to you. What I tell people is stop thinking of them as special and start treating them like every other third-party 
that you have. And now all of a sudden, I'm not worried as team A on the pipeline of team B. I'm worried about the output of that pipeline mm-hmm. because that's what I'm worried about because I don't know the pipeline that GitHub is using. I don't know the pipeline that that GoDaddy's using or Twitter's using. I know I'm not worried about their pipeline. What I'm worried about is the contract we'd agreed upon and the availability of that service. So when I have companies marching down this, I say, stop treating yourself and your other team like they're special. Start treating them like they're any other third party you've ever held a dependency upon. Does that help answer that question? Like, because to me, yeah, it it's does. Just, they're just I think another third party. Uh, well, that's that's. I think that's a big idea when when you ha- it's not just a HTTP address and just calling a simple web service, but it's hey, this library code we refactored over to one of them. It has to live somewhere. And how do I get it? Like, like you yeah. said, just NuGet. It's just a regular yep. library. And that yep. pipeline can publish its shared library to an internal yep. NuGet repository. Yep. Exactly. Now, what's your view on the teams where it's a single team, not multiple development teams, Sure. but they think, you know what? We need to have multiple microservices here. It's just, just one team. So we're going to be the developers of all the different sure. Git repositories. How do you view those scenarios? It goes right back to the very first thing I was talking about. If I am working on a project, and matter of fact, I'm working on one now, just a pet project of mine. And the first question I asked myself was, which one of these needs to scale differently than another? Mm-hmm. Would I ever want to scale this separate to the rest of the application? And if so, I'm thinking, okay, that's probably a good candidate for a microservice then. Right? I don't want this tied to everything else. And I might actually have two microservices and still a monolith in the middle. Like, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a monolith any longer because it'll have its own data store, but it's going to be bigger than the rest because it might be three or four concepts, which I know always need to scale together. Mm-hmm. If I need one of these to be bigger, I need all three of these to be bigger. Right? And, and they're so tightly coupled uh, because they're not te- technically micro services because they're tightly coupled, then I just ship them together and they're in one pipeline together. Uh, and I might be shipping versions of it that didn't actually change, but I have to make that call on myself. So again, it's not the should microservices only be used by big multiple teams across organizations. Like, no, one team, one person, myself, can decide that I'm actually going to write three microservices. And another question that I ask myself isn't always, do I need to scale this separately, but can I use this functionality in another application I might write in the future? All right. Do I, will I need a priority queue in another application? Right? I have a tendency to really like this style of authentication. Do I really want to write this code over and over and over again? Can I find a way to make this, this like a multi-tenant microservice to where it's the same microservice, but now multiple of my applications are using the exact same thing and I can scale it up based on demand. So again, my mindset when it comes to microservices is breaking down the problem into things I might be able to reuse and things that I'm going to have to scale independently of everything else. That's like my number one question to myself is, do I need mm-hmm. to scale this independently? How often do I think I'm going to have to rev this area, right? Because if I'm going to make, if there's going to be something that changes a lot, do I want to have to redeploy the entire monster just because mm-hmm. I, I, I know I'm going to have to change this part a lot? Well, maybe I should break this out. So those changes are far less expensive from a deployment time frame, from a testing time frame, right? Because when you change a monolith, you should test every line of that monolith. Right. So, but when so I cluster- change a microservice, I only need to ch- test that microservice. So clusters of code that change for different reasons. Clusters of code that change for different reasons. Yeah, I would probably try to, I would ask myself, does this make sense to make these a microservice? Do I see benefit in having this separate from everything else in my code? That's just the thought yeah. process that I go through personally. I'm no, sure there's good. lots of that's people with different, with different explanations on when they decide to cut a microservice or not. Sure. We had one customer that, they didn't call it microservices, but we have them break out, break out one piece, and it it really only had what a handful of files, because one pathway needed to consume a Microsoft Access database, and so architecturally they didn't want to <laughs> they didn't want to expose that older dependency to all the rest of the code. Sure, sure, so. sure. That, that makes perfect sense, and I don't know that there's a a wrong decision to make them, but just remember that every one of those comes at a cost, right? There is mm-hmm. some maintenance there. There's coordination. There's agreements between, but of course, those agreements have to be true regardless. It's not like if we're a monolith, I get to change my signature, my functions willy nilly, right? Because right. you're going to break everyone that calls you, just like you're not supposed to change the contract that you've agreed upon that you expose as a microservice. You're not supposed to change that willy nilly, but it gives you the freedom to then go change those signatures the way that you want. Because I, as an end user, never see what's happening behind the API call. Mm-hmm. As long as your signature stays the same, uh, and you might do that through versioning or however whatever technique that you use. 
you're free to change and refactor however you want. But when we're tightly, tightly coupled and I can see your method and then I actually make a hard dependency and I call into something that you've exposed as public or you've been crazy enough to share with me so it's visible even though it's supposed to be internal and I can see it, now all of a sudden you're beholden to me. Like you mm-hmm. change that, you break us both. You don't have that freedom anymore. So again, there's lots of different considerations to think about on when I slice something up smaller and smaller enough. And now I'm a little bit more aggressive than I used to be because the technology is making it so much easier to make that decision. Yeah, it is. To bring in another buzzword, Web 3.0. Yes. And you've done some talking of this, but just for the listeners out there, how does Donovan Brown describe what the heck Web 3.0 is? (laughs) How do I describe that? That's interesting. No one's ever asked me how I describe it. But when I think of Web 3, the first thing that pops into my mind is blockchains, right? Mm -hmm. That this immutable ledger. That is, there's two different types though. There's permissionless and there's permission. And you're going to get in religious debates on either side. You won't get in a religious debate with me because I don't care. What I'm focused on is does this technology enable the next amazing developer to go create something that's going to change the world? So I know there's people much smarter than me that are going to go fix the whole proof of worth, proof of stake versus proof of history versus proof of whatever. They're going to figure out efficient ways to get consistent, I mean, get consistency And what I need to do is say, how can I enable this technology such that it's not just going to be a web 3.0 solution. It might be web three plus web two plus something else that hasn't even been invented yet. That's going to change the world in a fundamental way. And as a Microsoft employee, what I want to do is make sure that we offer you whatever the tools that you need to empower that next wave of innovation. So to me, it's not some people like web is evil because of proof of work and it's the solicit the, the bad things that can happen on the Internet. And I say, that's funny because bad things were happening on the internet long before Web3. Mm-hmm. Bad things are going to be happening on the internet when we get to Web7 or whatever it's going to be next, right? It's like, sure. So you can't tell me that, oh, it's bad things are happening because then we need to shut off every computer that's at, running at this very moment because they all have the potential to be used in a bad way. So let's focus more on the technology and maybe the good that it can do and find ways to go police the bad that's happening not only on Web3, but on Web2 and in probably every public cloud on the earth right now. So let's, get, let's stop having these weird debates and focus more on the technology. So to me, the technology is about the blockchain that underlies it, the ability to write smart contracts that live on that blockchain, and to be able to democratize a lot of things that today are centralized through the people who do our authentication for us, the people who own all of our data. Like, you don't own your data, right? Wouldn't it be cool? Imagine a world where someone needs to get a credit score, but they have to come to me to get it. Mm-hmm. They don't have to go to someone else to get my credit score, right? They can come to me to get it because I own all my data. And, I, and there's a way for you to ver- verify that I'm not lying in this data, that there's records that prove their signature signed by the credit card company that, yes, Donovan is paying on time. Donovan's mm-hmm. mortgage is being paid on time. They sure. can verify that, yep, PNC said this and Capital One said that and Fidelity said that, but Donovan owns his data, but he can verify that that data is legitimate. So when I want to know what Donovan's credit score is, I don't have to go to four different broker bureaus and trying to figure out if they can agree. And then I don't have to go clean up all that data because they have an address that I never lived at, or they claim someone else has lived at my address that never did there, or they have a last name that I never had. And mm-hmm. then someone's hijacking my social security number and my identity. That all could potentially go away when I actually own and control the data that is defining Donovan Brown. And we have this place, this public ledger that you can go and verify that what Donovan just said is true but Donovan controls and owns his data. So that, again, to me, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of cool, cool scenarios there. And then one of the other things is central bank digital currencies. And I was talking to a buddy of mine. He's like really concerned that Donovan, like that's the worst thing in the world. People will be able to control your money. I'm like, yeah, but there's some use cases where controlling your money might not be a bad thing. Like imagine if you're a parent who has to pay child support Mm -hmm. and you could pay it in a currency that could only be used for your child's health, for their education. Mm. And not for anything else. Like, mm-hmm. how cool would that be to know that every dollar you give for child support is actually going to support your child and not a vacation for someone else yeah. or designer clothes for someone else that's not your child or like whatever they're doing with this money, you have no line of sight of what's happening there. Or we have money for, for I don't know, a welfare system that we want Mm -hmm. to be used for food to feed your family. And you can't use that money, but to feed your family. Like part of me is like, that's, that's not a horrible idea. Like there's some use cases that that makes sense. And maybe we only apply those in those scenarios and we don't apply it in others, but I don't want to then condemn the entire technology because there's one bad use case, but there's so many good use cases. Is there a way for us to balance that? So again, 
blockchain is usually the bottom line of, if I'm thinking Web3, the first thing that pops in my head is we're going to be dealing with a blockchain or some type of digital ledger technology, maybe a blockchain, maybe it's not. And it's basically about freeing that information and allowing the people who actually generate the information, you and my, you and me, uh, mm-hmm. actually control and own our own information. What I noticed when I was looking at it very early on is that it's very nascent right now, right? There's still, I mean, even though, what, 2008 is when Bitcoin was really popular and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like when I look at people deploying apps and you see all the exploits of the apps and all of a sudden someone's lost all these millions of dollars because their Ethereum was stolen. And then I'm like, wow, man, let me show, let me show me their pipeline. Like, how did that code get in there? Like, pipeline, there's no pipeline. No. This guy just wrote it on his computer as his <laughs> Hello World app. And then he pushed it to the blockchain, not realizing what he'd done. And all of a sudden, all of his money is gone. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So he's making the same mistakes we made a decade ago. They're not using DevOps best practices. They're not deploying the dev environments or QA environments. They're not writing unit tests, just like you were talking about just a moment ago. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're sad because their program broke. Like, trust me, all of our first programs broke. We just weren't putting Ethereum or money on the line when our programs broke necessarily. So what I did is I went back and on Medium, I wrote a 10-part series of let's apply DevOps to Web3. It doesn't matter what type of development that you're doing. These best practices that we've defined apply across the board. I don't care if it's Web3 or mobile or AI and ML or artificial. It doesn't matter. If you're providing code to deliver value, you're going to want to be able to test that code scan that code, test it in an environment that's safe to fail. You want to be able to fail for free. You want to have a dev environment where you can run your code and see if there's any exploits. Mm. Pay your buddies in pizza to go see if they can break into it using fake ether so that you're not actually going to be putting yourself at risk before your code actually gets out into production. Give Mm -hmm. it an environment for your auditors to come in and audit your code to make sure that it's safe again before it gets to production. So many people are doing these things after it's vulnerable and there's no going back unless you architected your smart contracts in such a way that they can be made dormant on the on the blockchain. They're active and they're alive. Yeah. And as long as I have the address to your smart contract, I can exploit that API. And that's something that you're really going to want to make sure that you protect yourself from. And a lot of developers I see out there are taking hello world apps that clearly say at the top, this is not production ready, making mm-hmm. changes, trying to get rich quick, throw it out on the main net, and then they're broke. So with DevOps, DevOps is definitely up at the technology adoption curve, probably what's still still early majority, but it's kind mm. of climbing that curve. Oh, for sure. Microservices may a little bit, you know, a little bit behind it, but Web 3.0, where would you put oh, man, Web 3.0 on that curve? <laughs> way early, way, way early. Like there's a lot of people where they're still deciding. But if you look in the news right now, it's getting a lot more news. AWS has a team focused on it now. GCP has a team focused on it now. Uh, so their companies, big companies, Walmart just released the other day that cryptocurrency is going to be a major way that their customers start paying for stuff. So mm-hmm. I believe it's going to become very relevant very quickly. So start educating yourself on it uh, and make sure that you're an informed person and don't just take one person's biased opinion. Because trust me, there are people who are religious on both ends of this. Mm-hmm. And I try to keep myself smack dab in the middle. I listen to those who want to burn it to the ground. I think it's the worst thing ever. And I think it to the, the ones that where it should be the only way that we do things and it's the wave of the future. I'm like, okay, that future I think is going to be really, really, really far away. And burning it down just seems like we're throwing away an opportunity to write some really incredible software that could change the world in a very positive way. Because if you look at something like, what is it, Coinbase? Coinbase is a backed by a MongoDB database and it's using, not React, um, but I forget what the front end is written in, but it's like Web2 technology is backing mm-hmm. one of the most popular Web3 frameworks in the world. Like handlebars? Like the, the, <laughs> I forgot what it is, but it's the same thing that they wrote um, Hockey App in. Ruby on Rails, I think. I think it's Ruby on Rails oh, wow. on top of MongoDB <laughs> is driving most of Bitcoin. And here we are talking about, oh, it's Web3. I'm like, yeah, it's Web3 running on Web2 technology. Like the world, the world isn't all one or the other. The world is going to be this mesh of all the technologies that we bring to bear. So to me, I hope to put Web3 in the toolbox of every developer on the world, on the planet, so they can say, when do I use some Web3 stuff? When do I use some centralized database stuff and like Cosmos DB or Dynamo DB? Like, how do I put all these tools together to build something Mm -hmm. that the world has never seen before? So again, I never get into a religious debate on good or bad. It's like, how do I understand this technology and then give it, give that power and that flexibility and that option to every developer on the planet? Well, I like to level set by asking, you know, where where on the adoption curve it is, because there's 
so many things that get a lot of hype, which may mean that, okay, it's going to be a thing and there's a lot of people investing in it. But for the normal development team, it's a learn about it and wait and see, not go try to implement something right now. It's just too early. The tooling's not there, you know, unless you have a specific reason. Yeah. And unless you're doing like an NFT for a very popular brand that might want to sell some of those things. NFTs actually have a really cool use case if you're thinking about like season ticket holders. So like, again, there's some use cases coming up that an NFT isn't always an image. I have to find like, it. non-fungible tokens, which correct, is another right. buzzword that a lot of people haven't heard about Exactly. Yet. But think about a non-fungible token. I think it was the owner of the Dallas Mavericks who was talking about, man, every time we sell season tickets to someone, those season tickets are then sold to someone else. Right. When I can't make it to a game, I can then resell my season ticket to anybody and mm-hmm. they can go sit in my seat for that game. But what if I sold them an NFT and in the contract that an NFT, every time you resold it, I also got a cut. Like, hey, man, no, it's kind of like, like, yeah. like a deed restriction on products you sell. Oh, yeah, it's almost <laughs> like I get a royalty every time you sell right. my NFT so someone else can go sit in that seat. Uh, I'm not cut out of the cut out of the transaction. And not to mention what I sold you the season ticket for. You might resell it for much more when we're in the playoffs oh, or yeah. when we're, That's you know right. what I mean? When we're going deep into a playoff run, like, wow, that thing is far more valuable than it was. And now I'm sitting here thinking, man, I should have not sold that, that season ticket. No, it's okay. Because when I sell it again, you're going to get a cut of that. So NFTs aren't just images of crazy art. Like NFTs can actually be used for really clever use cases that a lot of people just haven't seen yet. And again, that's why I keep holding off my judgment on if it's good or bad and thinking we just haven't seen the really cool ways that we're going to use this technology yet. Yeah. I think it's a guess. Any idea could be great, but it's a guess as to which ones are going to be mainstream where 80% of the developers are going to use it versus which good ideas are going to be good just for a sector. That's true. And and the the best way to be prepared is to educate yourself. Yeah. Right. And and I, and I saw, I've written a few smart contracts, none in production, just enough to understand the tool chain, understand the languages, understand how to test them. I've deployed them to Rinkeby and I've deployed them to Ganache, like some just test nets and some local dev nets. And I've written a pipeline using Azure DevOps uh, on exactly how I would do all the same things I used to do with any other type of app and how I had to modify the templates that came out of some of these uh, Web3 developers who these frameworks clearly had never thought about being in a CI CD pipeline. Like they yeah. never thought about it because I'm thinking that's hard coded. I right. can't check that into source control this way. And then how am I supposed to change it from environment to environment? And you want me to rebuild my code as I move from one environment to another? Like, that's like rule number one, build once, deploy many, not build every time. Like, holy crap, like, what were they thinking? So I went in and luckily most of it's JavaScript. So I was able to re, like, retool their pipe, their, their, their templates. So mm-hmm. I said, okay, let me change this. Let me read this from an Azure function instead. I took all the hard-coded stuff out to where I could build the DAP once, which is a distributed application. And that distributed application can now be deployed without changing a single line of it to as many environments as you want with the information that it's needed injected through a call to an Azure function, right? Which is mm-hmm. like, that's, now this feels good, right? And now people can use that as a template for going forward. And we have some partnerships at Microsoft with some of the, the big names in Web3 so far that we're going to hopefully be able to make some noise about here soon. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, we're getting to the end of our time here, but I appreciate you uh, coming back on the show. and, <laughs> and- sure. Great talk about microservices and DevOps and Web3, just a kind of level set. Uh, <laughs> where are you speaking next? I just spoke at Ignite. So you can see that session on on demand. So yeah, I mm-hmm. think it's on YouTube already. It's a Microsoft Learn. I actually think I'm going to take some time off, right? Uh, last oh, nice. year, I took six weeks off. Uh, I, I left in the middle of November, didn't come back till January, and it was amazing. And I looked in my my vacation stash and it looks like i have enough enough hours to do that again this year so i'm going to talk to my manager nice. so i probably won't be speaking again publicly until sometime in 2023 awesome yeah that seems to be a theme uh man after dot net conf yeah, it's like push <laughs> and then all right we'll see you in january <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. good though that's good though yeah yeah you need to recharge but i really appreciate you having me back and I, what episode are you on now what episode is this 219 all right, so t- I was a number two, so 217. So I'll see you in another 217 episodes. <laughs> I'll be happy to come back. Awesome. Appreciate it. All right, All right, well, thanks for being with me. My pleasure. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. 
on behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.